It's sort of impossible to talk about Java too much without getting into objects, classes, and the whole idea of object-oriented programming. So today we're going to sort of start that discussion. In the first example that we already had, we did have um, we did have an example of a class, but the class was just simply um, there was a, a class to be the program. That's, that's all the class did was the thing that you ran and it just contained the code to go and do its thing. Um, and I think we did a hello world, then we did a hello world with a little more advanced thing to um, have uh, some randomization to it. Now we're going to start looking at class in more detail. And again, we missed Monday, but I, I put out a, uh, a video. And so we're going to go over the example and talk about uh, the stuff in there and sort of expand on that. Um, first of all, some definitions in order. Uh, what is a class? If you had to define it, and use your own words. Don't be afraid if it's not what the book says, because I don't think I would use the book's definition. Yes? A class is a framework, okay? Um, uh, it doesn't look like that projector is on. Doesn't look like that projector is on. Okay. In which case, we'll do this. I'm going to reword that just a teensy bit. It'll, it'll keep the, I think, main ideas, but maybe phrase them a little bit differently. I will say classes provide a framework. For us to build applications. Uh, Closely associated with the idea of a class is the notion of a component. And that is that back in the old days, our programs were just giant monolithic entities where a whole bunch of stuff was all mixed together. And with the advent of object-oriented programming, the idea is, is we're going to create components. And we'll use those components sort of as building blocks as we build an application. All right? So, yeah, that the associating classes and frameworks is, is excellent. Next, anyone would care to add to this description or definition? Yes? Okay. Okay. Classes contain attributes and methods. Another word for methods is functions. Okay. Anyone else want to add to that? No, I mean, all these things are right. It's just the better description that we can get for it, the better situation we're going to be in. Like template of what you're coding? Okay. Your Classes are a template. And that's also true. Anyone else? I would say a key idea are classes are a software model of some 
for lack of a better word, Hannity. Um, there's something in the real world that we're creating software to deal with. All right? And again, these entities are part of what are called our problem domain. Our problem domain is what we're trying to solve, why we're creating an application or applications. All right? Um, the problem domain that we have typically is going to consist of a bunch of entities, a bunch of real world things, and our programs consist of entities as well. So we want software representations of those entities. All right. Now here's the interesting thing. The Java framework can provide us classes for things like GUIs and menus and drop-down lists and those sorts of things because those are common to a bunch of different applications. In this class, we're going to be most interested in creating what are sort of called business classes, entities that exist in the problem domain. And I say the word business class, but when you hear business class, think problem domain class, because it doesn't have to be a business. Um, if we wrote a game, you know, a game isn't really a business, but a game has a problem domain. All right, and there are entities in a game. The game Monopoly, I'm sure you're all familiar of. What are some of the entities in the game Monopoly? Properties. Properties. Uh, game pieces. Ga game pieces or players. Yeah. Okay. Um, what are some other ones? Money. Pardon me? Like the, bank. the bank. The money. Okay. Anything else? Jail. All right. Different things on the board that aren't, different spaces on the board that aren't properties, like community chest and chance. All right. The board itself is an entity, right? Because it's important that you go in a certain sequence. Go is an entity and all that. There could be, if we were writing a Monopoly game, again, it's not a business, but in our problem domain, there are entities. And if we were writing this in an object-oriented manner, we would write, we would create classes for each of those entities. Now, classes, as we mentioned before, have a couple of things associated with it. They have uh, attributes, and they have methods, all right? Methods are a way of, typically you can think of a, a method as being a calculation. All right? Whereas attributes are characteristics. All right? What are some attributes of a, of a property in Monopoly? Yes? The rent. The rent. Okay, so let's write a property in Monopoly. The rent. What else? Let's pull up. Let's, let's see if we can find a Monopoly property card. sure that that is the same. Yeah. I'm, I'm thinking of just a property. What are, yeah, what are some attributes just looking at this? Yes. Number of houses. Okay. Number of houses. Um, what else? 
you must be the only one in class that's played Monopoly. Go ahead. The Boolean property of whether or not there's a hotel? Uh, hotel. And actually that would be a Boolean. Okay. What is, uh, what is uh, another attribute of a property? Yes. The cost of the property. The cost of the property. The mortgage value of the property. The name of the property. The color of the property. That's use that that's interest are important because it uh, um, it matters if you have all of them of the same group. So the color group. All right. Yeah, that would, that's at least, if that's not all of them, that's a good number of them. All right. And I just realized I'm writing on this and you can't see that. So let's go back over here and create a new, a property in Monopoly. Some of the attributes include the name, or some of the, some of the things associated with the property. The name, the rent, the number of houses, the cost per house, cost per hotel, Is there a hotel? The cost of the property? The mortgage value of the property. We can think of some other things that happen where properties are involved. A player lands on the property, right? Okay. So there could be an action, land on property, all right? What happens when you land on a property? You have to pay your rent, or you can buy it. Or? You can continue on. Yeah, you can continue on, or you already own it, in which case nothing could happen. So there could be a method on a property that says this property has been landed on by this player. All right? And it's not straightforward what you do. There could be, and there pro in fact there would be, who the owner is. You need to know who owns it, right? Because different things happen when you land on the property based on who owns it. If I own it and I land on my property, nothing happens. If I own it and you land on it, then you pay rent. If you land on it and no one owns it, you have the option to buy it. You're asked, do you want to buy this, yes or no? All right. Uh, actually, according to the official rules of Monopoly, if the player passes, uh, then, then the property is auctioned off. So there's another thing that could happen. There could be an auction of a property. All right. Some of these things are simply values, right? Nothing fancy to it. The name of the property, you know, Park Place, uh, Boardwalk, uh, Marvin Gardens, all those things, that's just, that's just a value. There's nothing, uh, there's no process associated with it. The things for which there's just a value would be a property of the property or an attribute of the property is probably a better word. So properties, uh, classes have attributes. Classes also have methods. And again, 
land on property I described as a method because there's definitely an algorithm of what happens when a player lands on the property. You first look to see if the property is bought. If it's not bought, the person has the option to buy it. They don't buy it, it's auctioned. If it is owned, it depends who owns it. All right. If the player owns the property that they've landed on, then, it's, then nothing happens. If the player doesn't own it, then they pay rent. So there's a process to go through. All right. Every property has that algorithm, right? Just like every property has these attributes. All right. Um, let's forget for a second for railroad and utilities. Okay, because railroad and utilities are properties. We'll hold that thought later on in the semester when we come back to inheritance. When we talk about inheritance, someone remind me to talk about monopoly again. For now, let's just talk about the, the, the streets and the avenues. All right? Because those don't have hotels. All right? They do have rent and so on and so forth. The point is, is for every street property in monopoly, these characteristics exist. All right? And in addition to those characteristics, there are certain behaviors, there are certain things that can happen to that property. The property could be bought, it could be mortgaged, it could be landed on, it could be auctioned. All those things are processes that happen that deal with the property. So there's characteristics or attributes, and then there's methods or functions. That's true for every one of the properties. Now, for some of the properties, um, each property is going to have its own name. Each property might have its own rent, and so on and so forth. All right? We're talking about students in a college. If our problem domain is to write a system that does everything, everything possible within a college, what are some of the properties that would exist for a student? Name. ID number. Student number. Address. Email. Major. What are some of the things that a student can do? Sign up for courses, delete courses. They can enroll in a class. They can add a class. They can withdraw from a class. Students have a GPA that can be calculated. Students can apply for graduation and get that approved and, and graduate from the, from the college. Students can declare a major and so on. Every student has those things that they can do and things that are known about the student. When we define a class, we define those things. We define the list of attributes that that entity has that are important to our system. We don't necessarily define every attribute. For example, I doubt anywhere in LC's records do they have a record of your height. All right? That doesn't matter. You don't get, you don't get extra points if you're tall or short. You don't uh, graduate with more or fewer credit hours depending on your height. Um, so it's not relevant to the problem domain. So the kinds of things that we do at a college, really no one cares how tall you are. All right? It's based on other things. So yes, that's an attribute of student, but it's not really relevant to the student. All right? um, students could eat a meal in the cafeteria, but that's probably not relevant to the kind of records that, that the college keeps. You don't get credit for eating lunch or, or you know, you, you don't, you know, it doesn't really matter to the system. So, a thing to keep in mind is that these attributes and methods are what's relevant to the particular problem domain we're trying to solve. All right? Attributes being characteristics, being typically a value. All right? Methods being a process, code that goes and does some sort of manipulation. All right, let's look at the pizza example that I created. Oh, yeah. Let's look at the pizza example that I created. 
And then we'll move on to definition number two. This is a real simple class, all right? I've defined three attributes and then a handful of methods, all right? The three attributes that we are interested in for this pizza are the size of the pizza, which is small, medium, or large, the type of crust the pizza has, which is either thin or thick, I think, and then finally, a Boolean that says, does it have pepperoni or not? All right. Now, keep in mind that this probably wouldn't fly in a real pizza shop, right? Because you have all different kinds of toppings. But we simplified it. All right, just to look at something. Um, just to look at, at a simple, straightforward um, example. Those are the attributes. Those are the things that are relevant to the problem. And the problem that we're trying to solve is to, you know, have, write an application for our system that will help us process our orders, price our orders, schedule things such as delivery, give information to the customer, and maybe accumulate over time how many orders we had on a particular day, how much we sold, and so on. We could then use that information to maybe determine how much uh, flour we needed for our crust, or how much pepperoni we need to purchase, how many boxes we need to have, how many dealers, or, or not dealers, delivery per people that we would need, and so on. But at any rate, we're starting small in this example. And we just have three attributes. Notice a couple things. First of all, to review, public class pizza, just about all the classes we create are going to be public because we want other entities to be able to address them. So we have a public. It's a class. Um, for the first part of the course, all we're going to be creating is classes. We're not going to create anything else until six or seven weeks in. And the name of the class is pizza. Notice pizza is capitalized, and this is in a file called pizza.java. So the file name matches the class name with a .java at the end. All right, that's sort of review from last time. We have our brace, which matches up with this brace down here. Now, I'm going to do some indenting here to make the code a little easier. Actually, no, I'm not going to do any indenting. I could indent a little bit just to show that everything is contained as part of this class. All right, there we go. And again, the curly braces go around everything that's part of the class. One of the very common errors that I see is uh, people don't match up their curly braces. And much of the time when that happens, it's because uh, um, they're a little sloppy with the indenting. If you indent it, Notepad++ will tell you if it matches up. How do I know it matches up? Because if I put my cursor behind this guy, it matches up with the one that I would expect it to match up with. If I put my, bra my cursor over here, it matches up with this. All right, every attribute in here is a variable. All right, we give it a variable name. That's what these are. This is the type of variable it is. This is the name of the variable. A variable can either be a object reference or a primitive. And we'll talk more about that later on. All right, the difference between it. Strings are actually objects. A Boolean, which is simply an indication if it's true or false, is a primitive. You can tell that at a glance because string is capitalized and Boolean is not capitalized. 
So class names are capitalized. Primitive names are not capitalized. The variable names typically follow, like I called, like I described before, the camel case, where the first letter of the variable name is lowercase. Each subsequent word is capitalized. So this is a Boolean that says has pepperoni. This variable can either be true or false. True means has pepperoni. False means it doesn't have pepperoni. So this class has three attributes. These are the only three things I'm interested in this pizza. The size, the kind of crust, and whether it has pepperoni or not. Variables always have a type and a name. So what this says is we have a variable, a type of string, and the name of the variable is size. The type is string, the name of the variable is crust, the type is boolean, the name is has pepperoni. We're going to declare all our attributes private. This is a little bit different than what you might have done in C sharp if you created class. How many of you created classes in C sharp? All right. Um, and some, some of you may have used classes that other people created, like classes in the framework in C Sharp. Uh, it's good programming practice to make your attributes private, or later on we'll learn about protected. All right? But for now, we're going to call them private. The reason is, is we don't want someone to be able to go in the code and or another, when I say someone, I don't necessarily mean a malicious person breaking in to the, to the computer at night. I just mean we don't want a program that is able to directly set the attributes of a class. We want to limit access to the attributes to certain methods that we've created. So we're going to control access to those attributes. So you can only get to those attributes through methods. Why do you think that's a good idea? Yes? It prevents people from doing some screwy things with... Um, if somebody else comes along and writes code that works with your method, they, they can't do something screwy that breaks it in unintended ways. Exactly. All right. When we create a class, we are creating a component. We want that component to be as, uh, as robust, as air tolerant, uh, as strong as we can possibly make it. We want to make it essentially foolproof. All right? So we're not doing it today, but we're getting in a position where later on we can put validation so that we can only set the size of the pizza to one of a couple legal values small, medium, and large, let's say. And we can only set the crust of it to maybe a couple different values. Another example would be if we had an employee that works a certain number of hours in a week and we create a paycheck for them. We're going to put validation in so someone couldn't enter in a negative number of hours. So, oh, you work negative 10 hours, so instead of a paycheck, you're getting a bill for $200 or something like that, right? We want to control how people access those attributes. And by people, I mean people writing other programs. So therefore, these are going to be private. So people, other programs can't access these attributes directly. They can only ask to access them through the different methods, all right? And we have, for each attribute, we have two methods. We have a get and a set method. All right? A set method is the method that we use to give that attribute a value. A get method is the method we use to get the value for that attribute. So, We'll see examples of that when, when we actually go and run this code. All right? 
So I'm going to create a pizza, and I want to say that the size of the pizza is large. We're going to call the set size method to do that, because we're giving that attribute a value. Likewise, if we want to know what the size of a pizza is, we're going to call the get size method. So other programs can access these directly because that could have potentially bad consequences. We're going to require any other program that wants to use these attributes to use the get and the set method. So we can write control, we can write validation for these things. Now in this case we have a couple other methods. One that calculates the bake time. Actually, I stand corrected. That's the only other method we have to calculate the bake time. And the bake time is defined as if the crust is thin, takes 10 minutes to bake it. Otherwise, if, otherwise the, uh, the, the bake time is 16 minutes. So this will return 10 minutes if it's a thin crust pizza, uh, 16 minutes if it's uh, not a thin crust pizza. I don't know if any of you have ever been on the east side of Cleveland. There's a place called Citizen Pie. Any of you heard of it or been there? How long, how long does it take to bake a pizza there? Like three minutes, right? They have this oven that's so hot, and they make like super thin crust pizzas. They slap that thing in there. Before you turn around, it's out, and it's like done. It's, it's amazing. Oh, let's, let's, let's stop for a minute. You work at Lorenzo's? Yeah. Okay, talk to me after class. We will become best friends, I promise. I love Lorenzo's pizza. Place is awesome. That yeah, that is that is probably my current favorite pizza place. Uh, Rosie's in Lorraine was always my favorite. I I don't know if Rosie's is still open. Oh, okay. Yeah, Rosie's is always my favorite growing up, but but uh, uh, Lorenzo's is on that level as well. Right. It is. It is. It's, it's amazing. We don't have that good of an oven in our pizza shop. It takes us 10 minutes to make a thin crust pizza, and it takes 16 to make a, uh, a regular one. So this is an example. This is another example of a me method. It goes in, and let's look at the method again. Public means the outside world can call it. Double is that's the type of value it's going to return. It's going to return a number that contains decimals. That's a double. The name of the function is calculate bake time, and it accepts no arguments. We then have an algorithm that says, OK, bake time, we're going to initialize it to 0. If the crust is equal to thin, then bake time is 10 minutes. Otherwise, bake time is equal to 16 minutes. And then we're going to return the bake time. All right? So, when we call this function, we get an answer. That answer is going to be a double, and it's going to be the bake time. Let's look at these get and sets. The set method takes a string as an argument and sets the size attribute to the value of the string. Likewise, the set crust, likewise, has pepperoni. That takes a Boolean. The get size doesn't accept any arguments, but it simply returns the value of those variables. Okay, so it returns a string for size, returns a string for uh, get crust, and returns a Boolean for has pepperoni. So this is our class definition. These are the things that we've said for our application we're interested in about a pizza. We're interested in the kind of crust, the size, and whether it has pepperoni or not. Okay. We have methods for each of the attributes to get and set them because we want to make these private. That's called uh, data hiding, I think. Uh, that's a term for it. And that's a good idea. Essentially, we don't want other programs or other classes to know too much about what goes on inside our class. It's a component, right? If I have a component, if I have a mouse, right? I don't need to know all the wiring that goes on inside of it, right? I trust that that works. If I'm going to use that component, I'm simply going to plug it into my computer and start using it. So you shouldn't have to know about the innards of a component or a class to use it. 
So this is our template. This is something that we could use to build our application. It's part of a framework that we define. All those things that we said about classes applies. Now our next definition is an object. What is an object? Class, we said, is a template. It specifies as a description of what is relevant about an entity in our problem, what attributes and methods. What is an object? An object is kind of like create an instance of the class. Right. An instance of the class. That's this great object-oriented terminology. What do we mean by an instance of? What's another way to say it? Pardon me? A glimpse, an occurrence, a, a member of that class. So pizza is a class. We've attempted to describe everything we're interested in a, in a pizza in a class. The pizza that I ordered is an object, is one member of that class. All right. If I order two pizzas, there's two objects. Object one for the first pizza I order, object two for the second pizza I order. There's a student class, if we were writing a college system, that has all the things that we're interested in about a student. All the attributes that students have, all the methods and functions that a student can do, enroll in a class, apply for graduation, this, that, the other. Every one of you is a member of that class. So if I was writing code about that, each one of you would be an object. All right. So each instance, each occurrence, each member of a class is an object. So I wrote this code, and I hope that it works. All right. How do I know it's going to work? I'm going to have to test it. Now. Certainly, if you imagine us building an application for a pizza, a pizza shop, it's going to have a lot of different components in it, right? Not just this one single pizza component. It's going to have a component for the GUI, for the graphical interface, that the person that's taking the orders maybe over the phone can go and enter in the order. They want a pizza. This is, what, this is how big they want it. This is the kind of crust. This is whether they want what the toppings are. They want a second pizza, and they can enter that in. So there's going to be a GUI all right, that allows the entry of new pizzas. There might be a, a GUI that shows the drivers, like what deliveries they have to make. Like, OK, two pepperoni pizzas go to this person on this street. One cheese pizza goes to this person on this street. So there might be a GUI that shows that. There would be order entities that collect up all the pizzas that a person ordered. There might be other food items that the, that the restaurant sells besides pizza. So there'd be a whole bunch of components. <coughs> we want to test this component, though, before we're done with the whole system. All right? We want to test our code before we're done with the whole system, including before we're done with the creation of a GUI, right? Testing an individual class is called, oftentimes it's called unit testing. We're going to test one piece of the puzzle. If we were working for, let's say, a big nationwide pizza chain that had involved, a, you know, maybe a half dozen programmers, each programmer might be responsible for creating certain classes. I, my job might be to create the pizza class and the order class. Someone else's job might be to create the driver class and the delivery class or whatever. All right? <coughs> we would all have an idea of how our classes should work, and then some designer would know how everything fits together. Maybe another person's job is to create the GUIs involved. We would all work to create our classes individually and make sure that they're right. And then, once we were sure that they were right, we could try to test everything together. When you bring everything together and test it, that's called system testing. So unit testing, system testing. Unit testing is where we test a component. All right. System testing is where we test all the components working together. The 
theoretically, every component could pass unit testing, but the system tests could still fail. Why? Well, because maybe they're just not talking to each other right. Maybe the components, the connection between the components isn't working. Maybe each individual component kind of does its own thing, but they don't work and play well with others. So when you bring all the components together, it doesn't work. So what we're doing for the first part, for the, for the, for the most part of the semester, is we're going to be doing unit testing. We're going to develop some components. We're going to develop one class, two classes, three classes, whatever. Then we're going to test those bundles of classes as a unit and make sure that they work. How are we going to test those? We're going to test those by writing test code. All right. Writing a Java GUI is, is long and involved and is, is a bit of a pain. So we don't study that until we're already somewhat familiar with Java. So we'll study that towards the end of the semester. Well, how do we test and run our code? We're going to write little test programs. And what those test programs are going to do is they're going to use our class, create objects, that is, create instances of those classes, call different functions on them, and make sure the results are correct. So for this particular example, we have a unit test. We're going to test our pizza component. And what this does is remember, as I said before, when we write an app, when we're going to run this test, we have to have one class means a public static void method of main. That's my unit test class. So what are we doing in that public static void method main? We are creating an instance of our pizza class. So we are creating a new pizza object. That's what p equals new pizza means. That means that we are creating a new pizza object. All right. P set size is calling the set method on the pizza object to say this pizza is large. That's what set size L means. We're setting the size of the pizza to large. P dot set crust is setting the crust to the pizza as thin. So now we're talking about a thin crust, large pizza. And finally, we're setting the property of pepperoni to false. So we're calling these functions. When we create this new pizza class, these don't have any values. We call the set method to set the size to whatever our argument is. So we make it a large pizza. Now the size variable has a value of L. The crust has a value of thin. And has pepperoni has a value of false. After we do that, I'm going to go and run the calculate bake time for this pizza and display the answers. So I'm going to say the bake time is, and I'm going to call the method that calculates the bake time. It's going to go through the logic to figure out if it's thin crust. If it's thin, it's going to say it's 10 minutes. If it's not thin, it's going to say it's 16 minutes. Okay, so let's run this. Make sure everything is saved. It's in my folder called pizza. So I'm going to go to the command line. Maybe. CD desktop, CD pizza. Here's a shortcut that I do, like when I'm grading stuff. You can say Java C star dot Java. That'll compile all of your classes. 
So you don't have to compile them individually. In fact, Java is smart enough if I just said Java C unit test dot Java, it'll know that, hey, the unit test class uses the Java class, so it will compile them both. It compiled them both. Again, sort of no news is good news, right? I do a listing. Notice that I have pizza.class and java.class. And I can run this. And it'll tell me the bake time for this is 10 minutes. Is that correct? Yes, it is, because we made it a thin crust pizza. And the bake time for thin crust is supposed to be 10 minutes. Now, I know in your earlier programming classes, your teacher probably told you, don't hard code numbers. Don't hard code values. That's not a good thing. All right? We are only hard coding values in our test class. Our test class, our unit test class, is essentially throwaway code. It's code that we're writing to make sure our little component works right. Later on, our pizza class would be incorporated into a larger application. Okay? It would be hooked to a GUI that allowed the user to enter that in and so on. So don't feel bad over the fact that you're having a hard code. I've also had students like be upset about this and write like these elaborate things that accept input from the command line, like for the first person or the second person. The first pizza is then you type it in and all that. There's no need to do that. You can hard code it just like I did. <coughs> did I test this thoroughly enough? I tested it and it came out with the results I wanted. Is that enough? No, because you have not, you've only checked for thin crust. I've only checked for thin crust, yeah. At the very least, I should test for the other thing that's relevant, and that is if it did not have thin crust. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create pizza2. Pizza2, set the crust, and then output the bake time for pizza2. I could give them more descriptive names and say pizza 2 represents, you know, pizza thick, pizza thin. Or I could put a comment that said that. Which is, I think, what I'll do. So P1 is the thin crust thick. Uh, test case, P2 is a thick crust test case. And sure enough, this one tells me that the first one is 10 minutes, the second one is 16 minutes. So that's correct. Is that adequate testing? It is, because I applied a test technique called white box testing. All right? There's white box testing and black box testing. And though the names aren't really accurate. White box testing means I'm going to take advantage of knowing what the code does in writing my test cases. Black box testing is saying, I don't know what the code, what is what, I, I, I'm not going to assume I know what the code is doing, and therefore I am going to test more thoroughly. I know, because I looked at the code, that the only thing that matters as far as the calculation of the bake time is whether it's thin or thick crust. Doesn't matter if it's a small pizza versus a medium pizza versus a large pizza. It doesn't matter whether it's, there's pepperoni on it or not. 
So I know that I only need two th uh, test cases. One for thin crust, one for thick crust. All right. So because I know the innards of the code, I can limit it to two test cases. Otherwise, to thoroughly test it, I'd have to test a small, medium, and large, pepperoni, not pepperoni, thin and crust. That would be uh, 12 combinations, something like that. It would be a bunch of combinations to test that. A couple things I notice students in this class do is they don't test thoroughly enough. Um, most every program I've ever worked with, probably including myself, has not tested thoroughly enough. So one thing I try to, to, to stress in this class is doing adequate testing. And we'll talk more about that as the semester progresses. But identifying what you need to test and doing tests based on that. Okay? Any questions over this? There's a few small points I, I, need, I haven't made that I'll make on Wednesday. Unfortunately, we have uh, Monday off for Labor Day, or maybe fortunately. I guess I don't want to curse my day off too, too hard. All right. But uh, we'll pick up on this Wednesday and continue talking about classes, attributes, methods, objects, and so on. All right. See you in lab.